Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so today we're pleased to have Anna Fay from the Technical University of Delft, and she's going to tell us about splitting the sand piles. Okay, so good morning, and uh, thank you for coming. Just in time. So my talk is about. Uh, limiting shapes for a splitting model, which is a particular kind of sand pile model. And notably, well, it's not abelian. And that's kind of a contrast because already a lot is known about abelian sand pile growth models. And this one, well, tends to put people off because it's not abelian and that gets rid of uh, most of the proof techniques that are used so far. So let's see how far we can get with this model. Uh, first, I should say what we mean by a sand pile growth model. So, in a sand pile growth model, it's going to take my notes. We start with some uh, initial configuration. place a number n at the origin and h everywhere else. I will do some small examples in a moment. And typically n is large and h is not so large and then we stabilize this by uh, a sand pile rule. If it's an abelian sand pile model, can I abbreviate it like this, abelian sand pile model? Then I look at my, at my sites, at my grid, and I say, is there anyone who has more than 2D? Then I should give one to each neighbor. And that's uh, called abelian toppling. If we do splitting, then we say if height is at least one, then we do a fraction. We split the entire content of that site. We say one equal portion goes to each neighbor. So let's do a small example on uh, just a line, dimension one. So you put three at the origin and zero everywhere else. Then, okay, very small example. Okay, if it's a abelian sand pile model, then this one it's, it's more than two, so it, it should give one to each neighbor. And then it's finished. If it's a splitting model, then... This is more than one, so it should split in equal halves and go to each neighbor, and we have this. And then it's not finished because these two are still more than one and they have to split again. And it looks like this and then well you need one more step. You can see so. What is non-abelian about this is that this was a very small example. But let me make it a little bit larger. Instead of three, I put four here. We start again. Mm -hmm. 
This time I make another decision. I don't split them both at the same time. So maybe split this one first. Now you see it's going to make a di difference what decision I make next. Should I split this one first? Then I get another symmetric configuration and I carry on and I get some final results. Or should I split that one first? Then the final result will be asymmetric. So. And it will be a different result. So that is non abelian about the model because in, with this toppling rule, it never matters what order you do. You can do every unstable site at the same time or you can do them one at a time. You will always get the same results. In this uh, example, it matters a lot. So. You keep the splitting, but just correct the rule so that you only send, you leave mass one at the site. Then. Then the only the excess, then this problem disappears. Then it has another name. It's called, what's it called again? We call it the visible sand pile. The visible sand pile, yes. Yeah, but then it doesn't do the nice things that our model does. You'll, you will see in the second half. So we focused on two possibilities. Either we have some results that are valid for any splitting order you choose, but mostly we focus on a parallel order that's symmetric. Every time step you locate all the sites that are at least one and you split them all at the same time. So what else would So that is information on what we mean by a growth model and what are we interested in? Well, we want to know if, say these were very small examples, but if we put a huge amount here, we spread it out, well, imagine it will stop at some time, but maybe we can choose this age a little bit larger. There will be more mass around and maybe it will never stop splitting. So we make a distinction here. Robust, that means we have a, a value of h such that no matter how large we make n, it will always stop eventually. An explosive, that means if h is another value and there is some threshold n, such that if we put this n there or more and we start splitting, it will never stop. Well, depends. For, uh, for this one, we can prove a bit more than for that one. Then we are interested in uh, limiting shapes. Where did this strange terminology come Sorry? Where did this strange terminology come <laughs> Well, it was late in the night and we were tired and uh, we decided on uh, these names. And the referees didn't object any further. So I think in the first attempt, the referees didn't think this term was very appropriate, but we managed to defend it. So limiting shape of what? Well, what we do is when we are finished, then we give a special color to all the sides that uh, split or toppled at least once. So that would be this one, and now oh, that one also splits. This one split again, but it's not finished. That one will split, and well, so you get a set of sites that split at least once, and it will have some some shape, and this will depend on n and h, but maybe there is a limit. So, so what was the condition for coloring? If color split. At least once. What you did for the abelian sample model is you take the limits n to infinity in this robust case when you have an end result. And it turns out that there can be a limiting shape. Oh, we didn't bring your poster. 
There were some nice uh, abelian sand pile examples on it. Never mind. Okay, what we didn't do before, but what we're going to do today, is look well in the explosive case. We never thought that was something to look at because you don't have an end result, it never stops. But I thought, well, if you do this parallel toppling order, you have a process in time. Every time step it spreads further and you can look at the limit time to infinity see how it explodes. Growth rates, that would mean, well, it's growing as a function of time if it's exploding or as a function of n if it's robust and we want to know how fast it grows. So what's now? Ah weird examples. This is all uh, nice to look at in the abelian sandpaw model, but a bit more troublesome in this non-abelian splitting model. Let me show you a weird example. It's not completely n at the origin and h everywhere else, but it's nice to look at anyway. We have One point four, one point two, zero, and the rest is point nine. So what's strange about this example? Well, let's stabilize this. There are two sides that have more than one, so they will need to split. We could choose the parallel order. Then what does it do? Uh, this one puts 0.7 here and there. This one puts 0.6 here and there, and nothing else changes. So it's finished in one time step. But if we take another order, let's say we split this one first. Well, it's two, it needs to split again. These two are one, they will need to split again, and now 1.4. Well, you can imagine, it not only does much more than the previous uh, toppling order, it's never going to stop. So there's... Uh, Something strange here, if it's going to stop at all or not. We're not even sure if it depends solely on the splitting order instead of just on H. It's never going to stop. Is it true that every site emits a different amount of mass? This example, yes. So that's a question mark. And then this innocent thing, we take n to infinity. You might imagine that it's a property of this model that if you choose, if you have some n and h, and you say, okay, it spreads so far, you make n a little bit larger, it will spread further. That would be a logical thing to assume. But as it turns out, we have a counter example. If you take Okay, well, the numbers are rather particular, but it happens that if you take n is 5.36 and h is 0.33 and stabilize it, you find that 11 sides split. But if you increase sorry, wrong example, this one Well, 11 side splits, but if you increase n a little bit to 5.22 and you stabilize it again, only 9 side splits. 
So it's not monotone in N. And then, well, while we were starting to look for nice, strange examples, we found another one. These values, that's, uh, that's all just on the line. So you stabilize it, you find that 11-side split. But if you increase H a little bit to 0.36, and then only nine sides split. So it's not monotone in N or H. So that's another question mark here. In the abelian sandpan model, you can say, okay, if you find some value of H where it's explosive, then also all the, all the larger ones, they will explode in this model. Well, question mark. So in this, uh, another question mark. In this growth rate, well, all the, of most of the known, no, that's not true, never mind. I'm going to make a table here that summarizes known results for the abelian sandpan model. So what's, well, in this abelian sample model, you have particular, you have grains. They move in as integers, so you choose H only as integer. You can choose 2D minus 1. Then it's very easy to see if you, you, for some small value of N at the origin, you will start toppling. It will never stop. Because every site that has a neighbor that topples, well, it receives at least one. It will be 2D. It will need to topple itself. So this is explosive. Two D minus two down to whatever smaller value you can find. It's robust. Whatever here, D minus D minus one. Zero. You can even do negative values of H. You can go to minus infinity. There are some limiting shape results known. Most notably this one. You choose H is 2D minus 2. The limiting shape will be a cube. If you take very negative values of H, you take the limit to minus infinity, it's a sphere. In between, question mark. There are very nice shapes. You can look them up on David's poster, but there are no proofs about them. Then growth rates. It was proven from... Here on down, that you add n to the origin, you spread it out, it's going to grow like n to the power 1 over d. Well, actually, it turned out there was uh, an error in the proof, and it was only valid from uh, below zero. We fixed the error and managed to prove it all the way up to 2d minus 2. So, nice result. Then here it was explosive, so we thought, never mind about the growth rate. So now I compare that with splitting model. Sorry? Yes. You know the answers there for any well, that would be only this value of h. And then, well, in the first, well, you would have to choose a toppling order. 
So you might choose this parallel order. You say, well, first time step the origin tuples, next time step the neighbor's tuple, etc. So it just spreads linearly. You can show it, it was not in the paper, but uh, it's not too hard to derive. So what about the splitting model? Well, I put it at the same height as this value because, well, there's a factor 2D between them. So this By the same arguments as here, well, that would have to be explosive since if a site has a toppling neighbor, it receives at least one over 2D, it will become at least one itself, so everyone topples. That goes for arbitrary toppling order. For parallel, however, you can go a bit below that. So to compare, if you do dimension 2, then this is 3 quarters and this is uh, 7 over 10. So a little bit less. You can say for every H at least that, it's explosive. Then what do we have here? Sorry? Oh. <coughs> Maybe you could do it on the left side of the, the age uh, column. Oh, I can, yeah. Should we copy those values? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Make a bit of room here. So that was explosive and robust. Now we make the next one. Okay, gross weight because that is sooner finished. What we have is, fortunately, the technique to prove this, this n to the 1 over d, it uses Green's functions for random walk, so it doesn't use abelianness, it doesn't require abelianness, and we can adapt that proof for the splitting model, but it only works for h less than 0. So there's no new proof technique needed here. This sorry thing is, well, whereas for the abelian sample model you can go all the way up to H is 2D minus 2, but here no such thing. Because for H more than 0, you need abelian as for the proof, and that fails for this model. And then, well, limiting shapes. Now it gets interesting because for H at least one half, I put cube with a question mark. Why is that? Well, then we can perfectly well prove that if it stops, then it will be a cube, but we are not sure if it stops or not for this H value because we only know it's robust for strictly less than one half. This follows from the proof of that one, so it's the same story as before. This, as I just explained for the abelian sample model, you choose the parallel toppling order. 
first time step the origin topples, next time step all the neighbors, then all the neighbors of that. It grows like a diamond in time. So it's a limiting shape. For the abelian sample model, there's nothing in between here because you have integer values of h, only one explosive value. For the splitting model, you have many values in between here. And it turns out all sorts of uh, strange things happen there. We find In this very tiny range, that was going to be that way. So this is a very small interval, it's between 0.7 and 0.75 for dimension 2. You see many different things happen. We can prove a square, we can prove an octagon as t to infinity. I think we only just started exploring that, so next. I'm going to, where's the cap? Ah, oh, there it is. Just to show you what happens there. So we switch to the screen now. <coughs> and I'm trying to wake up my laptop. So what do I have here? This is uh, MATLAB. I wrote a MATLAB program to simulate the splitting model. What I did was write a program that uh, it calculates exact values. Because if you naively program this splitting model, you say, okay, you make a split in dimension two, so you divide the side by four. And you go on lots of times. Well, every, time, every new time step you divide by four, so very quickly you will get uh, rounding errors. And I didn't want that because to decide whether to split or not, you have to see if it's exactly one or not. So you don't want rounding errors. So what I did was, uh, well, make powers of two and keep uh, every one of them in an array, so it's a huge and uh, very slow program, but we only want to look at small examples, so it'll work. But that's why I have to choose H this strange way. Let's first... Let's start with a large H. So you see one half plus one fourth plus more. It's going to grow like this diamond. What is this? It's the size of the grid you're going to look at, and this, it's not n, it's 2 to the power n. No, the n is 2 to the power 3. So. Well, this is the predictable diamond, not much news there. Let's try another value that is below three quarters. Oh. Do this. You see, totally different behavior. It still grows linearly in time, but you can clearly see the limiting shape is going to be a square. So 
uh, it stops when it reaches the boundary. See how slow it gets after some time. That's because I have more and more powers of one half. No. But for these easy examples, well, it is. You can clearly see. So let's look at another one. I make H a little bit larger. And see what happens this time. It's a little bit more than a square. Because H is a little larger, so some sides can decide sooner that they want to split. And well, I'm going to convince you that in the limits, this is going to be an octagon. This is that slope. And more in the x-axis than in the y goes. Oh, that's because my figure is not square. My book. <laughs> <laughs> That helps. <laughs> yeah, I nev never know why MATLAB chooses to this figure size, but it's really symmetric. <laughs> Sorry about that. So now that we're at it, I show another value. Make H a little bit larger than this. And try again. It's another octagon. So what we did so far is we have a proof for this diamond that you can imagine. Just did that in two sentences. We can prove this uh, first square that I just showed you. More or less same method, a little bit more elaborate. We can prove this squarish uh, octagon that I just showed you, which is getting very elaborate. And this one, well, Hayan was getting uh, enthusiastic. She said, oh, I can prove another octagon, so she's puzzling over this one. It's not simple. It's, uh, I'll show you in a minute what, what these sort of proofs look like. First, another demonstration. I wanted to show, no, this one as well. See, it's a lot like that octagon that you saw before, but it's a little bit more than that. I think it will be uh, some polygon with 12 sides. So, well, you can go on with that. We've only just seen a few examples. You think these are not rounding errors? Sorry? These no. are not rounding errors. No, okay, well, to calculate, to show this figure, I add up all these powers of one half and that might get, might get rounded, but the calculations are exact. That's why it's so slow. I don't know. Are you Getting tired of this, or want to see more demonstrations? Or? How much precision do you end up needing to make a picture of this size? Oh, I would have to look. I didn't really care about large scale simulation. I think I see the example, I see more or less what happens. I try to prove something. But I didn't run them for a really long time. But, well, I checked, and uh, after very few steps, you already get uh, below machine precision. So this is definitely, you need the exact program. And if you run for time t, do you need to store about t? Uh, that's what I do, but it's, it's possible that I didn't wrote the most efficient possible program. I just keep everything, thinking, well, I'm not looking for optimal speed anyway. <coughs> so, 
Just to introduce the proof method, I'm going to look at the simple diamond again. But now, step by step. Small example. So what we see here, time zero. There's n at the origin, there's h everywhere else. And n is uh, more than one. So that's really all the information you need to get this diamond. You don't need to know exactly how high it is. Just that it's, well, it's more than one, it's unstable. And all the others are h, and h is at least two quarters. So that's only two states that I'm interested in. Instead of uh, continuous, uh, infinitely many possibilities. So I go one step further. Okay, now the origin is empty because it just splits. So now I have three different kinds of sites. The ones that are still aged, the ones that are unstable, and the ones that are empty. Only three kinds. I'm not interested in what precise value they have. And if I keep going from this point, Well, it remains like that. Um, all I need to know is, for every site, is which of the three states is it in. So, in fact, it is a cellular automaton with three states. And I can write it down like that. I can say every empty site that has four unstable neighbors, it will be unstable the next time step. Because it receives at least one over 2D from each of them, added up, you get at least one. So every site with height h that has at least one unstable neighbor, it will be unstable the next time step, because it already has three quarters, and it will get at least one quarter. Every unstable site, well, it will split, it will be empty the next time step. Couldn't it have an unstable neighbor? No, because we do this parallel order, you never have two unstable neighbors. So instead of this splitting model with rule, you can just describe it as a cellular automaton with three states. So that's what we did. We defined the cellular automaton with transition rules and state space, and we proved the limiting shape theorem for that. Why do we do this so elaborate? Well, because we want to use this method for the other for the other shapes as well, and there it gets a bit more elaborate. So let's look at the square again. In steps. Same situation, we have h everywhere, well h is less now. We have n uh, at the origin, it splits, it sets off the neighbors. At first it likes to be a diamond, but very soon... Well, this one couldn't split yet. Because it didn't, well, it got some amount from the neighbor, but not enough to reach one. So this is another state. It is h plus something, but it's not one yet. So we need more than three states this time. In fact, what we need is, well, we have empty sites again. We have h. We have this kind that is almost one, so I gave it the letter p for poised, about to split. But not yet. Then we have these. That one is unstable, but only barely. So I gave that another letter. It's a new state, it's well marginally unstable, it's M. And then this one you see is a little higher than that. So it's a different kind of unstable. And I gave it the letter D. Why is that? Because 
it had in the previous time said it had two neighbors that split, so it gained at least one half. And it's more above one than this one who only got one portion. And then, okay, I have these ones in the middle that I don't really care about because everything interesting happens at the boundary. So I just call them C for central. And I have another cellular automaton with seven states. Didn't I just name six? Yes, but I needed the seventh one because what I do is each of these states that has a letter, it corresponds to an interval of heights. And without the seventh one, I got interval of I couldn't find a value of h that satisfied everything. So I had to complicate it a bit one step further. Now let's see what happens. So this one, it doesn't split, but three of its neighbors will. So next time step, it will get very high. And it's in the class of one of, of these ones, the diagonal ones. It received more than one portion. So what consequence does that have? Well, it will split, of course, the next time step. But it will set off its neighbor. This one got portion from only one side, but it was so high that it will continue. So, well, you see the pattern repeating every two time steps. So well, that is enough to observe that every odd time step you get is really high. If you get these high sides, that will take care of uh, further growth. So that's how we prove the square. Now we go to the octagon. Maybe you should first look at it again. Let's see, this was what we looked at before. Ah, so I will do that again a bit slower. So first it uh, looks just like the diamonds. Then see it can't go, grow like a diamond anymore starts to look like the square, but something else happens. Some side says, "Van hey, I can advance a little bit further. And you get this, this funny uh, sort of roof on the edges of the square. So I have another cellular automaton about that. That started uh, this summer holiday. My husband brought his uh, Sudoku book and I brought my notes. And I was playing around. And I thought, well, hey, this is going to look like that octagon that I saw. That's half a year ago by now. It took me months to puzzle everything out precisely. It wasn't as simple as I thought at first, but I didn't want to give up. And by now we have a cellular automaton with uh, 13 states and a long list of transition rules, but it works. So let me show you the program. Instead of telling you the rules, I just uh, programmed them. And we can look at the uh, demonstration. It starts from here. Why? Because I have this, this classes of heights, saying if the height is between this and that, then I call it that state. If it's between this and that, I call it another state. Shouldn't be too large, shouldn't be too small. I can't fit that in the initial configuration with n at the origin and h everywhere else. I have to wait for eight time steps before all the heights are in their right intervals. Then I can start. So it starts with this.
and then it grows according to cellular automaton transition rules. And you may observe that the pattern is repeating. Well, maybe it's not so clear as in this diamond and the square case. But have a look at this, this tiny side pointing out. There's another one here, another one there. And this little corner, it repeats every two time steps. So just wait for that one to appear again. It takes five time steps. One, two, there it is again. Well, it looks a bit different. This, it used to be there five time steps ago. Now it's here. So we proceed another five time steps. And now it looks like ten time steps ago. But only what happens, there's one more of them. So the pattern nicely repeats every ten time steps, but another building block like this is added. So once you have that, then it's an inductive argument. It will, in the limit, it look like a huge row of these tiles and the limiting shape is an octagon. So that's how the proof works. It's a bit elaborate, but it works. Right, I was going to get to our open problems at the end because now we've, I've showed you that lots of interesting things happen in this tiny interval of age. That we prove a number of them. We have three limiting shapes in time. A diamond, a square, an octagon. Well, maybe Hayan will figure out the other octagon, but I advised her not to. I went through a lot of misery the past few months. But, well, what about all these other things we saw? Is it true that in this nice interval you always find a polygon as limiting shape? Does it depend on n or not? I chose a particular value for n to simplify the proof. But we have a feeling that for other values of n it will be the same shape. And what about... Well, what I didn't show you yet is I showed you values of h that were at least one half plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. Above that, we saw all these nice polygons. But what if we go a little bit below that? So I do this. I alternate. The value I get will be very close to two thirds. Just above. Um, okay, try a demonstration. What numbers did I use? I think these. What's this? Oh, sorry. Oh, take this out. There we go. So, okay, it stopped. You can see here H is 0.667. It stops. When it stops, it has to be a square. That we know. But now I increase uh, N a little bit. See, it's not nearly acting as predictable as it did just a moment ago. You can definitely tell it's not going to be described by a cellular automaton. I even am not sure if this thing is going to have a limiting shape at all. It seems to change shape all the time. 
It looks a bit squarish at the moment, but it will look a bit different sometime later. I think you saw before that at some point it decided to almost to be a sphere and then it turned square again. So. Okay, that could also be possible. But okay, this, this model is not always so simple as it seemed just a moment before. I chose this value very close to two-thirds for a purpose. We actually think that there is a threshold value, exactly two-thirds, that above two-thirds it's explosive and below it is robust. So I gave you that value here that we can prove. It's more than two-thirds in dimension two, it's seven over ten. And I found a method, well, that can get a little bit closer. I can prove 0.683, but it's still not two-thirds. But based on the simulations, we are convinced that it is two-thirds. We don't know why. That's As I showed before, there's another additional problem with defining a threshold H. Once you find a particular value of H, okay, there it's explosive, you're not even sure about the next of the one that is slightly higher because it's the model is not monotone. So that's what I wanted to conclude with. Nice model, nice results, much more open problems. Well, then everything must have been completely clear. <laughs> I think we're all fascinated by the last the simulation here. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's a pity that it gets so slow. Do you, do you see um, what's the largest number of sites for a polygon that you've seen? Sorry? What well, kind of look like um, one of the simulations that you had a polygon? Want to stop this and look at the other one? Have you seen a polygon with more than 12 sides? Oh, let me possibly. Uh, let me see, I wrote down this other value because it looked nice. Shall we try this one? Shall I try another one? Okay. What was it? I thought this one looked nice, but I don't exactly remember what it was. Okay, you tell how many sides it, uh, sides it has. Is it an octagon? I thought this one looked nice, but I didn't really look into it. So how about the height you know, on the inside of the time function describes the height? And these insides? Yeah. I've so far I only looked at the boundary because that's where the shape is determined. Is it much different in the center from halfway? I mean, there's something showing in that picture. The height is not constant. But that's this sort of star-like pattern that you see, it also changes over time. So um, I think it's more and more constant as time progresses. 
So are the uh, spokes of the star higher or lower? Than higher. Like? No, lower. Sorry. Mm. Let's see. Here's the color code. So orange is higher than yellow. But what are the units? The, the heights are actually 40 or 50? No. I will have a print the heights times 60. No, times, times something to make it come out nice. Black is empty? Yes. So the heights are around one, they're just a little more than one. Uh, this is uh, almost two, so I think I print the heights times 30.